All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gabriel Montalvo. For those of you who know, don't know me, I am the chairman of the Hispanic Caucus. This is our third event. And I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. And a big round of applause to Joe Rose and Fernando Urbe for coming to you know, come and speak and really share their message. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming. <laughs> and to all of you for actually making it out tonight. A uh, little bit of information of what we're trying to do here. The Hispanic Caucus is an idea of many of the board members uh, from the New York and Republicans Club as well as members. We're really here to show the Democratic Party, the liberal media, the agenda that we all know and love so much that we rant and rave about every single day, that Latinos, Hispanics, do not have to be Democrats. We do not have to be liberal. We don't have to be progressive. Through you showing up, even if you're not Hispanic, you're Hispanic in my book and in our board members group, you support us and as they like to say, an ally. For sure. We were able to endorse Curtis Lewa, who ran for mayor recently, and we endorsed Vicky Palladino, who actually won her city council seat. So congratulations, Vicky. It's no small feat. We had our board members from the Hispanic Caucus, as well as the New York and Republicans Club, actually go out and door knock. Uh, Fernando Acosta, who did a great job out there. And a very big thank you to Aldo Solares, our Hispanic Caucus Treasurer. Right there. And Denise Flores for, as our Corresponding Secretary and our wonderful photographer. Thank you. We are certainly growing. We are not going anywhere. And we are creating a group chat to actually engage with our people who have come to past events, uh, who uh, plan on coming to more events, current events. We have been uh, shadow banned to a certain degree, so this is our way to get directly to you with our message, as well as receive your input and feedback on how we can improve and consistently grow and build a membership base. So everyone who's purchased a ticket here will actually be able to uh, participate, and we would love to hear your feedback. Uh, so expect an email from the Hispanic Caucus very soon. And just in case, make sure you check your spam folders because we send an email at first with information and uh, we had some issues. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce a very special guest, Joe Rose. She's an activist, actually worked for the city government, but refused to cave to the mandates. So thank you very much. so much for inviting me, Gabriel. Thank you, thank you, Denise, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, like it was stated, so basically, I used to work for the Department of Education. I was a power professional. I worked in a self-contained classroom um, for District 10. So basically, what that is is that um, typically the other classes, they have 20 or almost 30 students. In this particular classroom, they had about 12 students, and some of them were assigned to a one-to-one -one staff member that either assisted them with either emotional behaviors or academic challenges. I had a student um, that was from the Dominican Republic. I am myself from there as well, even though I was born and raised in the Bronx. My, both my parents came from the Dominican Republic to this country, um, basically seeking financial opportunities. And I think you all can relate, if you're Hispanic, to the fact that if you come to this country, and especially if you live in New York City, that automatically you fall on the Democrat Party. And I used to be one of those. And then um, eventually, I voted for Trump, and I received a lot of backlash and hate because of that, like a ton of hate mail um, coming from people that I went to high school with, as well as, um, you know, I hate to say it, but white liberals and black Democrats that basically told me that I was misinformed and that I was a sellout and a coon for deciding not to vote for Democrat or do identity politics. Um, I got involved into the anti-mandate uh, movement because I knew from the beginning of March 2020 that something was very wrong when the government tells you that you can travel, that certain jobs are considered essential, that you cannot send your children to school, um, that you can worship. I, it reminded me right away uh, of Nazi Germany. And I tried to warn out people in my social media account on Facebook, and people told me that I was crazy, that I was a conspiracy theorist, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But as time went by, 
Um, I was for in right, and as right now we see in year number two, from the two weeks to slow down the spread, the government has gotten a lot more power, thousands of people unemployed. You see the, the hypocritical leaders like de Blasio um, and others um, in Democrat-run cities and states. And you see them not wearing masks, you see them living their lives normally while children are suffocating in school six to, t six to t hours, eight hours a day with the mask on, being yelled out by staff members. They decided they want to put on the mask for two seconds just to breathe. Um, I wasn't abiding by that whenever I saw a student that took down their mask. I was not going to enforce that because I see, I see it as, who am I to tell someone else's child that they don't have the right to breathe? And so I started out um, back in October, November 2020. I went to an anti latin protest in Union Square. Um, it was open mic, and I was given the mic to speak, and I just started going off. I said, we need to shut down Congress. We need to sh shut down the Blasio and all of these people. Yeah. And I <laughs> bet you, I said, I bet you they're not going to talk about lockdowns anymore. If their salary is going to be affected, they're not going to be pro-lockdowns because I saw the disruptions of businesses, people that literally had spent all their lives to work hard to get whatever little they were able to attain, and now this is being taken away under the excuse of public health and safety. I said, someone that cares about you, they would not do that to you. And so what I started to do with people is that I tried to explain from a psychological perspective, I went to school for psychology, although I did not finish my studies, but I grew up in a bit of a dysfunctional household, and so, those experiences, dealing with people, narcissists, toxic people, uh, employers, and things of that nature, help me to understand exactly what is going on. Because I know many of you here have asked yourself that question as to how come people do not see the agenda. Um, it's easier said than done, but I'm telling you, it has been many, many years of psychological manipulation through the mainstream media, and we that are here present, we know exactly how the mainstream media can take something, and January 6th, an expression, but the government has been destroying our lives, and that, that's not, they don't consider that terrorism, but when you guys went for January 6th, I personally, I wasn't able to go because I had to work. But I, I saw the lies from the mainstream media because I had friends that went there, and I myself went to D.C. a couple of times for Trump, and it was quite peaceful. And one thing that I can say, that I, I stay away from the whole political stuff when it comes to the movement, because it helped me get even liberals and Democrats to understand what's going on. So when I go to my, my rallies, I do not speak about it. Um, and that has brought a lot of unity, including people that support Black Lives Matter. I don't support Black Lives Matter, but what's happening in this country is affecting everyone, regardless of race or political affiliation. And at the end of the day, whether people want to agree with this or not, we have to find a common ground to unite because this country is under attack. The world is under attack. And the thing is that this country is the last free nation standing. Yeah. And if we lose this country, we lose it all. There's no one going, going to save us. Typically, we go to save other countries. Yeah. There's no one coming for us. Australia and other people are looking to the United States, particularly New York City, to see, hey, what are you guys going to do? What are you guys doing? And so that's how I started. I started with two or three people on the side, on the bullhorn, freezing cold. And then from there, I, I had a social media account, my Instagram page, that has been severely shot upon. And so I had to create a backup page. On my main account, I have almost 19,000 followers from all over the world. Um, from Texas, Florida, uh, different states here as well, people from Europe and Australia, which, you know, I'm, I'm great that they're able to see that there's people here that are not agreeing with the agenda because if you just follow the mainstream media, you would think that everyone here in New York City is with this nonsense, and that's not even the truth. And then, again, they also do not, do not like to portray that there's people of color especially black and Latinos that are against this. What the media used to do when I started doing my protests, because I was the only person of color, they would crop me out of the pictures and put <laughs> Trump white supremacists, <laughs> New York City anti-vaxxers. Yeah. No, seriously, that's what they used to do. And I'm like, this has nothing to do with white supremacy. This is an issue that is affecting everyone equally, regardless of race. Now, if you guys have seen my protests now, or our rallies, I don't like to call it mine, it's everyone's movement. If you go see it now, you see people of all walks of life. You see black, white, Latinos, Jews, and it's amazing because, guess what? Biden said he was gonna unite the country, and I guess he was right. He definitely united yeah. the country. Yeah. So, 
I, I thank him for that because everyone is chanting, let's go Brandon. And so, hey, people love it, people love it. And, and, and so I, I'm going to explain psychologically why people don't understand. So I, I spoken before about narcissism. If we go back, for example, to slavery when they had the field slaves and the ones that were in the house, um, it was the illusion that the, the house slaves were getting better treatment. But in reality, both were equally slaves. It was just the illusion. So when I use this, um, uh, uh, this analogy, I'm referring that to the scapegoat, the unvaccinated, and the golden children, those, the, the, the slaves that were in the house, got better treatment. The people that keep complying, it seems that the illusion that they're able to go to the restaurants, they're able to keep their jobs, they're able to freely travel. But, but at the end of the day, what narcissists do, people that are mentally ill, they like to divide and conquer. They have gone through the mainstream media. They use us, the scapegoat, because the scapegoats are the ones that are able to see to the, through the lies and the manipulation of the narcissist. And the scapegoats are the ones that are the true seekers and the true um, tellers. So the narcissist, they take all their shame, all their anger, any other negative emotions that they have, and they place that on the scapegoat. If any of you were raised in a dysfunctional household, the same thing happens. Typically, uh, dysfunctional um, parents, they would take one child, make that child a favorite, and then would take the other child, make that child a bad one. So they do that because if, if, if they don't divide them, then both children would get together and realize that they have one common enemy, which is the government who is acting like our parent. And so they, they, they go back and forth and they do like smear campaigns. A smear campaign will be when they get on the news and they say Biden or a Fauci says that this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. So what, what happens, people get on the news and they start to hear all these things. They start to hear that people that are not supporting the mandates, that they're not following the science, that they are conspiracy theorists, that they're Trump supporters, that it's white supremacy. So when you do a smear campaign, the, the goal is to basically tarnish the reputation of the scapegoat. And they have been doing, doing that for decades, and you can use that with the whole liberal versus conservative. You can apply this analogy of the scapegoat and the golden child to many other ways of life, whether it's a family system or the system of the government. Because people oftentimes say, well, how is it that the, the, the vaccinated, why are they not siding with us? Well, look at the mainstream media, look at the school system. The school system, unfortunately, even though I worked there, and I'm not saying that all the teachers were bad, but the school system is teaching children Marxist ideologies. They're teaching children that it's okay to change genders. They're teaching children that if they're black or Latino, that they can't do anything because you know they are inferior to white people. They're not teaching children to have common sense and critical thinking skills because if they do that, what's going to happen is that you become a threat to the establishment when they realize that you don't follow the group think mentality. So what's happening now is that everyone is complying for the, mo complying for the most part because people do not want to be left out. People are not taught, like I said, to be critical thinkers. When you get on the train, there's a lot of people that are wearing the mask because, not because they want to, but because they fear to be ostracized. What happens when you are in a narcissistic family household and you, as the scapegoat, you start to speak out and say, you know what, this is wrong. Even if the golden children, AKA the, uh, the vaccinated, even if what they see happening to us is wrong, even if they see that thousands of us were taken out of our jobs, and they agree because there was a few of my colleagues that they agree with me, but guess what? They were fearful of speaking out. Why? Because they did not want to be next. And that's what happens. And if you go back in history and you look at every genocide, it always happened because of the assistance of good citizens. In reality, some of the people that are brainwashed, they are good people, but they have been manipulated and deceived. And it's something that is, is very devious. And it takes many, many, many years. I've seen documentaries um, called Ideological Subversion, which it tells you that it takes about 15 years to de demoralize a whole population. This is why we see what we see. And sometimes I get aggravated as someone that is out in the streets. And I have dealt with a lot of hate. Like, I've had people give me the middle finger. I've been called the N-word as I was out doing my outreach. But I, I started to explain it to people how we ended up to that point 
And once I use the whole scapegoat and the golden children analogy, people understand. Now, the golden children, which are the vaccinated and the people that can comply, what they fail to realize is that for now, it seems like everything is okay for them. They're uh, the top class citizens. But the end goal of the narcissist is that they're going to discard both the scapegoat and the golden children once their agenda is fulfilled. Mm. So all of this, yeah, all of this is, 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 is uh, malicious, evil, mental yeah. manipulation. That, like I said, it, it, they've been working on it for years. If you look at even at the beginning of this country with the house slaves and the field slaves, because you have to ask yourself, how is it that people just, why didn't, they, why didn't the other slaves join together in form of collision to overtake their master because now we're redoing this other type of slavery but it's now it's not based on, on race anymore it's based on vaccination status and a lot of things that a lot of people don't know is that we are in the stages of genocide okay it, it has ties to slavery it has ties to nazi germany every and every other genocide that has been committed in the world at large is because of the mental manipulation because no one in their same mind would go along with this agenda of like you're all okay with your brother or your sister or your uncle because I've seen uh, people that were married and because of what's going on they have gotten divorced. I've seen parents that don't speak to their sons or daughters. I've seen sons and daughters that don't speak to their parents. And so Again, we need to go back to the root of the problem and realize that some of this dysfunction comes from within our own family unit and it has spilled out with the government who's acting like our parent. And I feel like once people start to understand that, then we'll be able to do more. Obviously, it's also political. Um, it's about power and control. And with narcissists, that's what they want. They want power and control. None of this makes sense. If you, if you look at it from the beginning, the, the Fauci said, that masks were a false sense of uh, protection at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Then once people got vaccinated, he said, you have to wear two or three masks. You know what that is? It's called gaslighting. Gaslighting is a technique that is used to make you doubt your perception. And what we're living through is uh, the cycles of abuse. If anyone has been with an abuser, whether it's a female spouse or a male spouse, they start to, to first they love bomb you, they're nice to you. Then they start to like sneak attack you. They start saying little things or they start hitting you. And then they're nice to you. They, they go love bombing you again. And then you start to think, well, maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe, maybe I'm confused or maybe they're, they're nice. And maybe they're having a bad day today. Just like with, with the lockdowns. We did the lockdowns two weeks because they cared about us. Mm -hmm. Abusers isolate their victims. Abusers stop their victims from having income. Yeah. <laughs> so... That, that's, how it, that's how it happens because many people are always saying, oh, Joe, I don't understand these people. And I, and I get frustrated, but the difference is between me and some people is that I've, I've done many, many, many uh, years of research. When it comes to psychology, I myself have gone to therapy. I'm not ashamed to say that because I grew up in such a dysfunctional household that I wanted to understand why I was acting the way that I was acting, why was I going to jobs and being treated the same way that I was treated in my home, why I was getting with um, uh, partners that were being abusive. And again, if you take that information that I gave you, if you start to search up the relationship of the golden child and the scapegoat, you're going to see that it's, it's the same thing that's happening right now. And like I said, abusers take away your income, abusers stop you from talking to your family members, and then they, they say, you know what, we're going to go back to normal for two seconds with the law, bomb, law bombing you, telling us, oh, we're going to up and back the city. And we all got excited, oh, yeah, we're going to go back to normal. But then, oh, no, the condition is that you must show your nasty pass. You must show your safe card, a.k.a. your vaccination card. And then it's going to continue because the minute that you show an abuser that they're allowed to do certain things, they're not going to stop until they have full control of you, your body, your children, everything that you own. And so I just hope that what I'm saying right now serves for a purpose because, again, we can talk about all the political aspect and we can sit here all day discussing that, but until people understand from a mental level and a spiritual level, then we're not going to be able to understand how to even go about defending the enemy. And the solution for all of this is that for the golden children, 
to realize that they're being manipulated and to join forces with the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. Typically in a, an abusive household, the scapegoats are the ones that end up leaving that system and they create a new system that's healthier and better for them. So when we talk about lockdowns and we talk about the mandates, oftentimes we discuss about making our own communities, making our own schools, building our own hospitals because this system is, is, is not working for us and the government that is supposed to be we, the people, they have turned themselves into full-blown dictators that we don't live in a free society anymore and our, vo and our voices don't even matter anymore. So I hope, like I said, I hope this serves well and I'm hoping that for the sake of children, because the children are the most vulnerable and typically what happens is with a child, the younger you are, the easier it is to manipulate you. Children learn from their environment. And being conditioned with this mask, which by the way, states used to wear masks. Mm. And masks are also a sign of like, you are not human, it's to dehumanize you. And it's to stop you from having human interaction with other people. What happens is that when a child sees their parent not showing any emotion um, reaction or any emotion of give feedback, um, there was an experiment on this, it's called the still experiment. Uh, a mother was instructed by a psychologist to just go blank in her facial expression. And the child started going through emotional distress and going out like this, seeking to get back a, 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 an acknowledgement from the, the mother because children, in order to learn empathy, they need to see smiles, they need to see faces. And our faces are our identity. They're the way that we can relate to each other. So by putting on the mask, they are dehumanizing you. They're telling you that you are a state, that they own you, that you're not even allowed to breathe, which is the essence of your life. And we are depriving children of oxygen, children whose organs are still developing, by the way. And so we're sending these children the message that living this way, which is quite abnormal, is normal. And psychologically speaking, it's gonna, some of this damage is going to be irreversible because children are being conditioned to see slavery for freedom because people think that slavery is just having chains on your legs and feet. This is a new type of slavery that is more digital. They want to have um, the health pass for digital. They wanna have all our medical records digital. Everything is digital because this is being ran by technocrats. And so they want to instill the, the social score credit system, which is what they have in China because they're trying to have us living by the Chinese Communist Party. And again, I, I implore and I, and I beg people to fight this off, not for yourselves, but for future generations. If you're not a parent and you're wanting to have children or if you're a parent, think of your children and think of your, your grandchildren in what kind of world do you want them to live in? Because we have the right to pursue happiness. And this is unconstitutional and they know that it's unconstitutional. And I have mentioned before that slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment. So if we, if we are not allowed to have um, the decision to what we put into our bodies, then to me, that amendment no longer comes and we are reversing back to slavery. But again, it's not just blacks anymore, it's going to be everyone. And so we must stand up because this is the last chance that we have. And like I said, there's no one coming to rescue America. America has to rescue itself and essentially rescue the rest of the world. So thank you so much for having me. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? Yes. No. No? Okay. Tell them how they can find you. Okay, so I'm on Instagram is J O, not like Joe Biden. <laughs> That's, I always have to tell people because they put J O E. So Joe is from my first name, Josephine. And then Rose, I, I pick up that name because I just like roses, so it's just like a nickname. Because I feel like my first and last name is Josephine Valdez, but I feel like it doesn't sound as cool as Joe Rose. Um, so uh, Instagram is J O Speaks Truth underscore. And then my backup page is J O Speaks Truth and the number two. Um, I do have a question. Sure, go ahead. So for those, um, and probably doesn't apply to those of us in this room, or maybe okay. it does, but for people that have that emergency break where they have an inkling that something is awry and not going right, but they still choose to comply, do you have a word for them, a word of encouragement for them to, to not pull the emergency break but to rather go with what their gut is telling them and to defy this 
uh, tyranny? Well, when I first started like um, doing certain things, for example, I'm going to give you the story of how I just stopped wearing the mask. So initially, when they told us to wear masks, I, I, I was like, I don't want to wear this. I, I thought it was just stupid because from the beginning, I, I, I saw the fact that people were dropping dead and shine on the floor, but that wasn't happening here in New York or anywhere else. So I put one and two together and I said, the Chinese Communist Party is definitely lying. Um, so I used to go to Whole Foods and just to get inside Whole Foods, I used to put on the mask. Then as time went by, like weeks went by, I, I just started like I just started getting angry because I felt like I know the mask doesn't work, but yet I'm still putting on the mask and I feel like I'm lying to myself and it's not it's not a good feeling when you're lying to yourself, right? Because you yourself know when you're being full of you know what, right? So then one day I just said, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm gonna get on the train, I'm not gonna wear a mask. And I was the only person, I'm talking about this is April 2020, May 2020. Mm. The train was packed, okay? And I was the only one not wearing a mask. And people were giving me looks and I'm like, okay, I had to breathe. Uh, you know, because now all the eyes are on me and I'm like, now I'm like, I stand up because I, I'm, I'm telling you, the train is packed and I'm not wearing a mask, okay? And when those eyes are piercing through your soul, you feel some type of way. So the more I started doing it, I, I got on social media and this is how I started to develop a following to encourage people, you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear the mask. I had people that told me, oh my God, Joe, I'm scared, but because I've seen you do it, I'm going to do it. When you first start to do something, and even life itself, life is about taking risk. Sometimes you have to um, get out of feeling comfortable and get uncomfortable. Because guess what, like I said already, this is the last opportunity that we have to have a free nation and a free world. When it comes to my freedom, I'm, I told my mom this last year, I'm willing to die for, to protect my freedom. So I understand that fear is how also we got to this point. I forgot to include that in my speech. Fear is how we got to this point, right? And again, if you do not start to do things that make you feel uncomfortable, then this is never going to stop. Your compliance is making this longer. So. I know it's easier said than done, but you have to start doing it. When we were children and we started to walk or ride a bicycle, it was scary. But guess what? The more you kept doing it, the easier it got. When I first did it and I went along and I'm like, you know, I'm not wearing a mask. Yeah, I was scared. But the more I started to do it, the more I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm still going to do it. Till this day, no one approached me on the train. I did have a couple of friends that unfortunately, for example, I have a, a, one of my good friends, she's Asian. The reason why I'm mentioning her nationality, her ethnicity, is because they used to attack her, but they wouldn't attack me. Now, I don't know if it was because of my race and people felt like they were afraid to do so, but she told me that I was the, I'm being honest because she tells me that, and I'm like, well, it might be true. She said, she said, Joe, because of you, I've stopped wearing the mask because she used to wear the mask because she was scared. She's Asian. People are going to look at her and blame her and be like, oh, she's Chinese. She was the one that brought in the virus because that did happen to, you know, a, a group of Asians that people were blaming them for bringing, bringing the virus. You know how people can be ignorant. So little by little, she just, she just started getting on the train. She started getting on the bus. And she thanks me for that. And that's what I want pe to encourage people to have the power to fight for your rights. It is our God-given right to breathe. The mandates are not the law. It's unconstitutional. And even if it's the law, even if it was the law, when tyranny becomes the law, the law rebellion becomes duty. Yeah. So, yeah. so listen, I'm sorry. If, if everyone would have stayed scared and no one would have fought this up, I told my mom, I still would have been a slave. So we need to get over that mentality of like, well, I'm scared. No, we're running out of time. There, there's not much time left. And we're heading into year number three because if you look at it, March 2020, it was like the whole year. And then 2021, it's been the whole year. Now we're heading into year 2022, and now they're going to vaccinate five-year-olds with an, an experiment. Not having it. So, so again, if you have fear, use that fear and transmute that fear. Get angry because anger, anger can be very powerful. Use that anger of the fact that you want to go back to normal and you want to be free because it's our God given right. We don't need to beg public servants to give us back our freedom. So yeah. find that in within you. I know it's not, it's, not, it's not easy, but again, if you don't start somewhere, then you're never going to own, own up to your own power. Okay, any other questions? No? Thank you. Okay, thank Woo! you.
Next, I'd like to present a friend of mine, Fernando Uribe, who actually supported me during, when we first met, when I had my first ever uh, Walk Away Hispanic American Town Hall that's with Brandon Strzok. I met a few of you actually over there. Uh, and he has been great. He's invited me onto his show. He is an educator, a philanthropist, and an overall great Republican friend that we have in New Jersey. We know how the elections went in New Jersey recently. Almost read, we don't know, if, I'd say election fraud. You'd say that, yeah. I'd say that too. But I'd like to raise it up to the stage now. Thank you very much, Fernando. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Now, I do look like, I, I know I'm dressed like Chris Cole, but I promise you I'll be much more informative. Okay? Um, I just want to say, how about Joe? Let's, let's give her a round of applause, please. Very good. Very good. Um, now, that's a tough act to follow. Let's see if I can do that. Um, you know, one of the things I take a lot of pride in in New Jersey is uh, not just being an educator, working at, as an academic um, in probably one of the most liberal college environments in the country. And being a conservative and being a college professor is not easy. Um, I get a lot of grief from my colleagues. I get a lot of grief from administrators. I get some grief from students because it's... You know, why I don't bring my politics into the classroom, it's easy to go on your smartphone or your computer at home and just Google Fernando Uribe and you'll find a plethora of different conservative commentaries, whether it's my own programs or appearances on other shows. Everything from Newsmax um, to NJTV and the like. And one of the things that really irritates my colleagues is the fact that I'm not overtly political in the classroom. Because I don't know about you, but that's not teaching. That's called indoctrination. And to me, uh, when I took a pledge to be an educator, when I you know, spent countless hours at night, gallons of coffee, mm -hmm. these dark circles that will never go away <laughs> from multiple graduate degrees, I, I promised myself that I wanted to teach. That I don't want to be those liberal professors that I had in undergrad at Rutgers University in New Brunswick or at Rutgers University in Newark for graduate school. I wanted to be different. I wanted to teach. Because it was, it was empowering, it was inspiring to me, like, hey, I get to teach political science and social sciences and be a positive influence for students. And let's be honest, these last five to six years have been challenging, not just as a political climate, but within academia itself. And what's really frightening to me is that I have colleagues who are around my age or older, we all have the same degrees, right? We all have PhDs, but for whatever reason, whether it's on their social media, or their activism on campus, I'm always mystified. I'm like, wait a minute, we have the same degrees. But somehow, by what comes out of your mouth, you're telling me you're a grown ass man and woman and you failed high school biology. <laughs> it's mind boggling to me. We have the same PhDs, but somehow along the way, you failed economics. And some of you teach economics, which is even more startling. And I sit there and going to work, now again, this is even pre COVID. Going to work was one of the most disheartening things I could ever imagine. I went to campus, I went to the faculty room, I sat down in my office, and I would put on my earphones, I would have my coffee, I would just put on whatever was on my iPad, and I would just detach myself. Because every single day it came to colleagues saying, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? No offense, like, I took enough quizzes. All right? I wanna be quizzed. All right? I went from like taking exams to grading them now. Okay? And every single day my colleagues would say to me, well, what do you think about this, Fernando? I'm like, well, I don't think anything. Can I have my muffin? <laughs> Is that all right? Well, what do you think about what Trump said? I don't know. He's the president. Or, well, at the time he was the candidate. What do you think? I'm like, I don't know. That's his opinion. <laughs> what do you think about Hillary? I try not to. <laughs> you know? And it became such a polarizing and toxic environment. And now it hasn't discouraged me because I enjoy teaching. But along the way, while going to graduate school and teaching, I also developed a love for media. Because I don't know about you guys and girls here, but I'm one of those that, I'm a political junkie. I grew up listening to WABC radio. I grew up listening to Rush, God rest his soul. I, got, I grew up you know, going to undergrad, grad school, and listening to different talk radio shows on you know, AM terrestrial radio and even on, on Sirius Satellite. And I found that love for politics. But when Gabriel asked me to come talk to you today, it wasn't not just about 
sort of blowing up my accolades. It's not about that. It's about sort of answering a very simple question. What's a conservative? What's a conservative in 2021? And I look at being a conservative through different lenses. I look at it as just not an academic. I look at it as the only conservative journalist in the state of New Jersey. But I look at it also, too, as being Latino, Hispanic. Okay. It's Latino, Latina, not Latinx. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I, find it inter- I find it very interesting. And again, no, no disrespect to my Caucasian brothers and sisters here. <laughs> but I find it very interesting when white woke people are trying to tell me how to identify as a culture. I find it insulting. I find it just, uh, I find it condescending. And I find it intellectually bankrupt. Let's just go with that. So I'm Latino or Hispanic. But when I think about being conservative, I think about my roots. I think about being the son of immigrants. I think about the fact of learning what it is to have a good work ethic, to understand the importance of bilingualism and multiculturalism. So when I think about my conservative values, and I think about where I got them, well, they're sitting over there. Those are my parents. You may not see them in the back, but they're, they're there. So my mom and dad serve as an inspiration to me. Because I was born here. I had it really easy. Not my mom. She had to leave Cuba with nothing but a suitcase at the age of 17. Leaving everything behind, knowing what it's not like to vote, what it's not like to not have a free press, what it's like to not have any basic civil rights. My dad, on the other hand, left a bad economy in Colombia. They came here not knowing English, having a decent amount of skills that you can use in the workplace. And they didn't come here looking for handouts. They didn't come here expecting someone to take care of them. They came here and worked. You know, I won't embarrass them, but I mean, they met in a factory. Okay? My mom being under 18, I think, and my dad was a little bit older, you know? <laughs> so. But, um,. But they came and they worked, and they built something. And along the way, you know, I came along. And along the way, I learned the importance of of hard work and family. And the idea that, you know, being a conservative is believing in, in these principles, in believing in a work ethic, in believing in family, in believing that you take care of your family, not the government. Government is not going to ever, ever give you the necessary tools to raise a family or to be a productive citizen. That has to come from you. That has to come from family. So when I hear my colleagues on the left, whether it be academia or in journalism in New Jersey, talking about, well, the nuclear family isn't important, that is bull blank, okay? That is nonsense, okay? The nuclear family is crucial. Now, I understand. Not all of us were blessed to have two good parents. Some of us come from single parent households. Some of us are adopted. Some of us are orphans. But the importance of the nuclear family cannot be understated. We have to look at the importance of a functioning nuclear family. Why? Because that increases our ability to be productive, to be successful. And when I think about being a conservative, when I think about conservative values, I think about the importance of family. The imp- the reality that government is never going to give you the best tools in how to raise your children and how to better educate yourself and what to do with your life. Nobody gave me a single thing. I grew up in a working class family with my parents, okay? I had to learn Spanish because I knew my God, the God rest her soul, who took care of me from birth till forever, and spending time with her, I knew the importance of of being bilingual, about multiculturalism, about the fact that, guess what? When I'm growing up, no one's going to take care of me. And my parents told me that. No, I can be a slacker. I can be a little bit lazy. They know. They come over to my house. And they know something. They'll see clothes laying around, whatever. But when it comes to work ethic, when it comes to being responsible, that's where it is to be a conservative to want to take care of you and your family, to not depend on government. 
When has government ever done anything correctly? Okay? They can't run the post office. They can't run the VA for our brave men and women that come back. Afghanistan. Okay? And now I have colleagues in academia and I have activists in journalism telling me that they want government to be even more expansive and invasive? You're crazy. I say this all the time. So when I think about conservatism, I think about, again, the reality that we have to, A, be responsible, okay? I've always been fascinated when I hear the idea about, well, when you're conservative, you're fiscally responsible. And again, no disrespect to my liberal colleagues and some of my progressive, you know, leftist friends, but I don't think being good with money or being responsible in budgeting, I don't think that's a conservative value. That's a commonsensical value. And for whatever reason, in government, the liberal media, our institutions like schools, common sense needs to be absent, all right? It seems to be like non-existent, you know? Like somehow like playoff baseball at City Field in October. I don't know. It's like non-existent, okay? I think about in my role today as an educator, how important it is to be fair and objective, to teach material, and to let students make decisions for themselves. Now, I can't help what they do in their spare time. I can't help that they come after me after class, after the first day of the semester. Hey, Dr. Riva, yeah, I Googled you, I follow you, I stalk, I'm stalk, I'm sorry, follow you. And I was like, oh, no, you got it right the first time, I'm stalk. <laughs> and I checked out your podcast. Man, like you're, man, you really make sense. Like, how'd you get, like, you read, you learn. You know, by osmosis, I learned a lot of great values from my, from my parents, you know? My dad's a political junkie. The reason I read newspapers as young as I can remember was my dad. Why I cared about being involved in politics. Why I cared about writing or reading or engaging in activism, working on campaigns. As obsolete as it may sound and as hopeless as it sounds for a lot of conservatives and Republicans in this room, we have to keep fighting. But more so, I feel that my bigger responsibility now is as a journalist. Because whether it's New Jersey, New York, I was just in Texas over the weekend, beautiful state. Yeah. Okay? I think about the importance of what it is to be a journalist. Not a propagandist, not carrying buckets of water for a particular party. Because folks, we have to be intellectually honest, and I'm someone who is that. And while I lean conservative, and I can remember that I, I voted, I can't remember ever voting for a Democrat for president in my adult life. I recognize there are some problems within the Republican Party. We have to be intellectually honest to do that. But when I look at the choices we have, when I look at a party that by and large still believes in the importance of family, in responsible spending, in making sure that we do not acquiesce to wokeness and this madness, by making sure we don't offend anybody, okay? I'm Cuban and Colombian. Okay? My Twitter feed is at no filter your eBay. What the hell do you think I am <laughs> when I just go by no filter your eBay? That should tell you everything you need to know. But more so being a journalist, I know that I have to speak up for conservative values. Again, not to be a propagandist, but to report on the news and to interview people fairly and justly. And I get a lot of grief, folks, from my colleagues in the, in, in the journalistic community in New Jersey. Oh, Fernando Sacella. Oh, Fernando's not really Hispanic. Oh, really? Yeah? Okay. You see me eat? <laughs> yeah? Ask my mother how I eat. Okay? Oh, I'm not Hispanic? Go watch me dance. Yeah. Then we'll talk. Okay? You know? Oh, I'm not. You know? Oh, I'm, oh, you're conservative. Why? Like, why are you a sellout? Why are you a self-hating Hispanic? Why are you someone that doesn't, for whatever reason, not necessarily toe the line, but believe in a party that does for you? Folks, the ROI, the return on investment that Hispanics have had concerning Democrats, leftists, and progressives has been zero. Okay? Maybe even net, maybe, listen, let's go back to basic arithmetic here. Negative integers, okay? Remember that? How annoying that was? Okay. But I find it within myself every single week on my podcast via Insider NJ. 
on my other shows to be intellectually honest, but to be philosophically consistent. That's all you can be. And I know the challenge that faces me. And people ask me, well, why do you, why do you engage in journalism? Why do you do a podcast? Is it for money? Yeah, I get some spots. That's nice. It's not, it's not why I do it. Is it for awards? Yeah, I've won some awards. My parents get aggravated. They're like, the living room looks like a shrine. Give me a break. <laughs> like, you know. No, I don't do it for that. And I know it sounds very self-serving, but it is. I do it because I feel, as a crusader, I feel like I'm willing to literally and figuratively die on a hill for ideas that make sense, for ideas that are right. Okay? I come up with terms all the time when I hashtag and I, when I plug my shows every week on Instagram, at Professor Fernando Uribe. I mean, don't look it up now, obviously. Um, or on Facebook. I always use the tags. I kind of borrow from Tucker a little bit. So when I always do my intros, I say, hi everyone, this is New Jersey's premier journalist and the sworn enemy of toxic progressives, the woke fools, the social justice clowns, and the alphabet army, that's how I do my intros. <laughs> and it drives my colleagues crazy. They're like, A, is that intro long enough? Do you wanna maybe buy extra airtime for your intro? Mm. And two, why do you have to be obnoxious? It's not being obnoxious, folks. It's about making a point. We're in, and I hate to sound really overly dramatic, but we're really in a battle for civilization today. Yep. We really, really are. We're in a battle of civilization against people that believe, for whatever reason, that government is the best solution to your problems. Not hard work, not, not opening small businesses, not going to school, educating yourself. Okay. Nothing's free, folks. Okay. Last, last, well, a couple weeks ago, Bernie Sanders came to New Jersey. And I remember to campaign for Governor Phil Murphy at my alma mater, Rutgers University of New Brunswick. It burned me. I was just like, oh my God. I felt like I needed like a tetanus shot just watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat there watching it. And I mean, I was recording a program, so I couldn't watch it live, but it was. It was simulcast on Facebook and all the social media apps. And I sat there watching the replay and, and listening to Bernie Sanders talk. And the following week when we did an election breakdown, a post-election breakdown on a show that I host, I remember saying, what good did it do the governor to have Bernie Sanders in? Here's a guy who's been in government 50 years, right? Give or take, right? 50 years or so. Okay? Right? And I said, you know what? Let me just be a smart ass here. Let me come, let me, folks at home, I said, let me give you a list of everybody that Bernie Sanders has uplifted out of poverty in his time in government. I said, ready, folks? Okay, here's the list. Number one, Bernie Sanders. And that's it. <laughs> and, my, and my broadcast partner was dying laughing. She's like, really, Fernando? Like, you just, you just love to boil piss. <laughs> it's not about boiling piss. It's about, being, it's about being factual. And I said to myself, and I get it. College kids, 18, 19 year olds. Listen, let's be honest, we were all 18, 19 years old. We were all dumb ones, okay? I'm sure that the 18, 19 year old version of ourselves, if they see us now, they'd be like, it's night and day, right? So I get it, I don't really blame kids. The kids cheering for Bernie. What I blame are educators, administrators, and media that felt somehow it was a good idea to bring a devoted and committed socialist to New Jersey to say progressive values is where it's at. Folks, progressives, all that they ever do is make things progressively worse. Yep. Okay? That's right. Whether it's economics, whether it's about, it's funny about science, right? I, I get this argument all the time with colleagues on media. It's funny what the left likes to pick and choose when it comes to science, right? They want to tell me that there's 35 genders. I don't know about you folks, I, I took AP Biology, I don't know about you, there's two genders. Okay, if that, if that annoys anybody in this room, I'm sorry, but that's just the truth, okay? You don't wanna believe in science, you believe in science when it suits you about COVID, right? You wanna believe in science when it suits you about climate, and I understand, listen, should we take care of the planet? Absolutely. Do I think Aquaman's gonna be at my door next week? Because we're gonna be underwater? For any, for any of you comic book fans who know Aquaman is. Okay, no, I don't believe that. Should we be responsible? Sure. Do we have to engage in carbon taxes and hysteria? Of course not. 
So I feel that my responsibility as a journalist is to help at least speak up for conservatives, and more so for, more so for Hispanics. Because what a lot of Democrats don't want to hear, even though we've we become a convenient base and a voter block, is that not just only New Jersey, because the census data says it, but nationally, we're getting browner. People like me, people like Joe, people like Gabe, people like a lot of you here. Okay? I don't mean that as a scare tactic. Oh my God, you know, everyone's going to be playing, you know, reggaeton in every block. No one's saying that. So relax. No one's going to be blasting reggaeton or bachata or anything else. Okay? No one's saying that. But as conservatives, yeah, embracing multiculturalism is amazing. We've got to do it responsibly. That's what the left can't do. And they haven't been able to do. So in closing, folks, you know, when I, when I think about my responsibility, not just as an educator, but more so as a journalist, now more than ever, we should want to be louder and prouder about our conservative values. Don't hide it. Go on Twitter, help recruit people. Retweet important and factually correct tweets and content on Instagram and Facebook. I don't TikTok because I, I just think that's obnoxious, but sorry. <laughs> Not that you get TikTok or Snapchat, whatever. But I think that my responsibility now more than ever is to be that journalist that is going to speak up for regular working class, good-hearted conservative people, regardless of race and gender and ethnicity. That, folks, identity politics, that's, I'm the last person to ever talk about that. What I talk about is making sure that we can at least be united in common sense, in common sense governing, in common sense policy. I talk about it all the time on my shows. I'm a policy nerd. All I ever talk about is policy with Christians. So when I, when I interview legislators, activists, journalists, candidates, whether right or left, and I interview everybody under the sun. I've interviewed the president of the New Jersey Socialist Society to the president of like, the Young Republicans of New Jersey and, everyone, and everybody else in the middle. What I believe in and what I do consistently is be down the middle and be fair to them. Because I want to have a conversation. It's not about who can scream louder. It's not about being Cardi B and being the loudest person in the room and that makes you right. No, no one's saying that. I think it's Cardi B, but you know what I'm saying. It's about wanting to have a dialogue. We should be able to have a dialogue with the other side. But folks, come with your facts. Come prepared. Come ready to take them out because they want to take us out. And unfortunately, there's no negotiating with the left. There's no negotiating. There's no compromise. There's no way to sort of play nice with them. No. We have to come with our facts. We have to come with our policies. We have to come with our belief systems. And I promise you, if we do this, not just me as a journalist, but each and everyone here in, in this room, whether you're a candidate, whether you're going to be a teacher, with any of you are in finance, whatever it is you're doing, when you come to the table, come prepared with information. Come prepared with facts. Come prepared to, guess what? The other side, they won't catch you off guard. They won't be able to fool you with phony science and phony statistics. Folks, read. Empower yourself. Educate yourselves. And I promise you that as conservatives, regardless of what our backgrounds are, regardless of our socioeconomic status, our heritage, whatever it is, we come prepared and we come to the table ready to fight we're gonna win that fight because we have facts on our side, we have faith on our side, and more importantly, we have family on our side. And these are three things the left can't beat. Thank you. Question? Yes, sorry, yeah. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I have two, uh, two questions. Are you still teaching? Yes, I teach still at Burton Community College in, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, they haven't kicked me out yet. We'll see. Uh, but um, teaching is the most fulfilling job I've ever had. Being able to teach in a college classroom, to talk about U.S. history, to talk about where we came from and where we're going. And that's something that, you know, I take a, I take a lot of pride and initiative in when I do that. So, so um, I know you'd like to take the stance to stray away from the politics and your teaching, but in terms of your 
perspective uh, and from coming from your students, do you see any opinions that are sort of straying away from the leftist um, ideology that is being pushed upon us then? Um, I would say that what I just try to do in the classroom is just be factual with my students. Like case in point, I, when I teach you as history one and two, uh, we spend literally the first two weeks of the semester on the Bill of Rights. I mean, I dissect that like that annoying frog that we did, remember sophomore year in high school biology? Yes. Yeah. Like that's what I do with the Bill of Rights. I dissect it completely. Because it's important to know what these rights mean. Yeah, they're not just some like hashtag that we can just throw out there. It's about understanding what those 10 amendments mean to us and why they're all important. Um, and that's how I approach teaching. And again, I can't control what happens in other classrooms. I can't control the fact that I have colleagues that walk around with Che Guevara t-shirts or say to me, oh, you know, they're uh, the new faculty advisor for the Democratic Socialist Club on campus. And I'm just like, oh my God, so you want to make people as intellectually bankrupt as you are. That's just great. You know? So you're telling people that, so you, so you don't know anything about biology and economics, so you want to make sure nobody else does either. Right? Is that what you're telling me? And of course, they'll be like, oh, you're rebates, I just know it all. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's more about, again, just coming to the table prepared with facts. And if you do that, you're going to win every single time. Anyone else? No more questions? Really? Question. Yes? Um, if, if, if a group of uh, Latinos wanted to um, step by step um, flip uh, Latino districts at the local level uh, politically in New York City, what advice would you give? Well, I hate to use her as an example because, you know, she's kind of like the most bombastic one we can think of in the region. But, um, you know, what, what AOC did uh, a couple of years ago, notwithstanding how intellectually bankrupt she is and the fact that I've never met a woman that loves to brag about her economics degree, but she doesn't know about economics. So what the hell did you study at Boston? Like, you just smoke weed and just went around? Like, I mean, I mean, that's... Whatever, that's what you like to do, God bless you. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, it's about mobilization. And if you're Hispanic, and if you want to push conservative candidates, you have to really do it grassroots. You have to knock on doors. You have to, it's not just about, you know, doing turkey drives and, and barbecues and, 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 and going to soup kitchens for the photo ops. Like, you have to kind of roll up your sleeves. You kind of have to knock on doors. You have to kind of really mobilize people with ideas. And again, I don't like her. I think she's a horrendous legislator at the federal level. But when you look at her model, when you look at what she did over the course of X amount of years, I mean, that took time. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to show up to a district that I'm just going to win. You have to kind of plant your feet in the ground and, you know, plant those seeds. And you have to mobilize and get people behind you. And if, but you, if you can't get people behind you with good ideas, you know, Democrats on the left, especially in New York City, you know, we just went through eight years of Bill de Blasio. The fact that he wants to run for governor, I mean, just, I don't know about you, like, I just, I need Tums. Just thinking about that, you know? But when we think about candidates, we have to think about coming to the, to the table with ideas. And that takes time. And everybody's willing to do that. People love the photo ops. People love the speeches and hashtags and Instagram. That's great. And you need that. Those are tools that are crucial. But you gotta be willing to roll up your sleeves. You gotta get a little dirty. You, gotta, you, you know, you gotta cut your teeth a little bit. Not everyone's willing to do that. If you're willing to do that, go for it. You know, and use those tools at your disposal. That's it. No other questions. Yes. Yeah. So you talked about common sense, and I'm with you on common sense, 100. What do you think? Common sense policy you can use toward Because that's the issue of the day. That's the only issue. Well, as I'm reminded, you know, by my parents, um, I'm a doctor, but not a real doctor. I can't prescribe anything. So um, what I would say, and I'm, I'm, they're going to kill me on the ride home. Uh, I'm going to have to take the path home. Uh, <laughs> um, what I would argue, and, and what was your name, I'm sorry? Lisa. Lisa. What, what I would argue, Lisa, is I, I think that, listen, I just came back from Texas, and uh, we, we were just in Florida in, uh, during Memorial Weekend. And I hate the fact how COVID's been so politicized. And I see it in New Jersey. I see it here in New York, uh, in Connecticut, you know, nearby Pennsylvania too. Um, I would argue that, you know, for a disease, and again, I'm not, I'm not a virologist, but for, for, for a virus that has a 97% recovery rate that I'm aware of. Um, higher. Okay, I, I apologize. Uh, you know, let's be smart, but again, let's look at 
if we're as healthy as possible, are there vulnerable populations? Absolutely. Okay, we have to take care of them, right? Uh, you know, the governor, Groper, I mean, uh, uh, Cuomo, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew sorry. Um, you know, when he recklessly went about murdering elderly people, as Phil Murphy did too, let's be honest, that's not science. That's just sort of expediting politics. And I would argue, to answer your question, I would say the most commonsensical policy is to make sure that we're not adding to hysteria, that we're not making our kids nervous, that we're not creating a panic among parents. Because we saw it in Virginia, we saw it to some extent in New Jersey. You start messing around with parents and their kids, there's going to be hell to pay in elections. There's going to be hell to pay next year when Republicans take the House. Okay? When Republicans probably will take the Senate too. It's because of this idea that you want to keep promoting fear to Joe's good point. You keep promoting fear at some point, people are going to act up and rise up. I'm not saying violence in the streets. What I'm saying is acting up, going to school board meetings, talking to different organizations, talking to their elected officials, and making noise. Okay? And this is the thing, and I say it all the time, and I'll, and I'll quote the great Joe Rogan. I just read it as I was at the airport yesterday. I was reading Cigar Aficionado, and there was an article about Joe Rogan. And he had a perfect quote. The reason he's against vaccine mandates, as I'm opposed to them, is because the minute we let government implement something, they're never going to take it back. Okay? Case in point in New Jersey. New Jersey, one of the right, original 13 states, well, guess what? New Jersey didn't implement a state income tax until the 1970s. And why did New Jersey do that? Because New Jersey felt that they needed extra revenue to build better roads. Okay? Why did they introduce the Turnpike Authority and the Garden State Parkway Authority? Because we needed revenue, we needed, to, we needed that tax and those tolls to build better roads. Why do we need this tax and that tax? Can you name me a tax that government's ever implemented that they've ever rolled back? I can't remember that. Because it's never happened. Because government, once government implements a tax, they never take it back. Once government implements some sort of mandate on you, they don't want to take it back. Now, either you act up in a responsible manner, either you vote people out, you mobilize, and you make noise. Use the tools at your disposal. I would just say, from a common sense perspective, it's holding those accountable, like, every single day. Those in power accountable every single day. Please. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, and I think, and I, I want to know, was there ever a point in the beginning of maybe before you were a journalist or whatever, where you did self-censor or overly, you know, tiptoe about being, being open about your values? And if there was, what helped you switch over? Well, in terms of being blatant, I mean, I, you know, my mom reminds me after being suspended from Facebook three times this year, uh, Miho, please be careful. <laughs> You know, you know, it's like, you got to spend it again. Like she gets a new friend request. She's like, you got to spend it again. Okay. But the reality is that when you're dealing with the left, when you're dealing with, with the toxicity of the left, whether it be in academia or journalism, you have to just be over. And, and I think what I tend to do all the time on my weekly shows, I'm really unapologetic about it. You know, so when I use those hashtags in my intros or on social media, the sworn enemy of toxic progressives, it's because they are toxic. It's not subjective, this is not me having, it, it's fact. We're seeing it with policy making, okay? When I say woke fools, it's because, you know, we think that teaching arithmetic and reading and writing isn't important at the age of five, but gender identity to a five-year-old is important. I'm sorry, you're not going to sell me on that. And it doesn't make me a homophobe, it doesn't make me a transphobe, it doesn't make me, you know, anti-LGBTQ, whatever continent they're adding this week. Okay. And again, nothing against the community. I have friends there. I have nothing against it. But the facts are facts. Or when I say social justice clowns, when you think everything's about cancel culture, when you think everything's about, oh, we have to make sure we don't offend anyone or get... Folks, you can, you, you can be factual. And if that's still offensive to people, that's not your problem. What I try to do every week is just be factual. I'll leave it up to my audience. I've been doing this for four years, going on five now. Thank God, you know, God willing, I'll continue. And I've been able to do so because I have a loyal audience. It's also because I make people think. 
Again, you don't have to like me. You don't have to like all my conservative values. But I'm going to get you to think. Because we don't think anymore. I don't mean this generically in this room. No, you all do. But we're not thinking enough as a society. We're not thinking enough as a, as a population. Folks, we're living in this time of tribalism. And I get it. Politics is tribal. Right? Like anything else, we got teams. Like, anybody like sports here? I'm a, I'm a sports fanatic. Right? We like our teams. We like who we like. We, we cheer who we like. We boo who we hate. That's it. But we have to get away from that, especially in politics. So what I try to do is just simply be upfront and say, this is what I believe in, tell me where I'm wrong, and let's have a dialogue. Screaming at me, labeling me a blank phobe or blankist, that doesn't solve anything. All it does is perpetuate the same narrative that one side of the aisle doesn't want to have a dialogue. And I don't know about you, it doesn't sound like I'm incapable of having a dialogue. I certainly am. Does that help you, I hope, sir? Yeah. Okay. Well, the reason why I ask is because sure. I know a lot of people wherever, a lot of people that I know, even leftists, are really looking at the way it's going and starting to quietly send me DMs like, hey, this is some, I don't, this is, you know, bullshit. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I want to help people step forward. I want to say, like, hey, the water is warm. And there were times in the beginning where I was like, eh, oh, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to try to, um, self-censor in a way, and I wanted to know, was there a time where you had had that switch for you, where you're like, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to be myself. Um, that's a great point. I, I would argue that I mean, being transparent and authentic is important. People will know right away if you're just sort of pitching rhetoric or if you're being sincere. And I think that in the time I've been doing journalism, I think I've come across as someone that tries to be uh, authentic and genuine because people want to believe in, in factual type of commentators and journalists, not the propagandists, right? I mean, listen, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure how many people are in this room, probably the, the same amount of viewers that CNN has nightly, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, you know, MSNBC maybe less, you know. But the reality is that while it, I like making jokes and the humor, you know, humor is therapeutic, we also have to quite, we also have to try to be, I think, factual as much as possible. Because many, many on the left don't want to be factual. It's all about feelings. And I get that. We're emotional. We're humans. We're emotional. I get it. We laugh. We cry. All right? we, we do all these things. But at the same time, I think it's about being factual and wanting to come to the table and have a discussion. And that's not always easy. What was your name again? Peter. Peter, it's not always easy to have a dialogue. It's not easy to have a dialogue with people you disagree with. I do it daily, if not weekly on my shows. When, I re when my producer sends, forwards me emails, oh, do you see what you pissed off this week? And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm like, are you taking me off the air? No, I love the traffic. I'm like, oh, well, what are you complaining about? Shut up then. <laughs> why, are you, why are you flooding my inbox with this stuff? But in all seriousness, I say, I'm getting people to think. And that's all you can ask for if you're going to be doing this type of opinion journalism. And I would just say that if you feel the need to do that or you want to use those tools at your disposal, like social media, just do it responsibly. Right-minded people, sensible people, will jump on with you regardless of their right, left, center, whatever. That's the best advice I can give you, Peter. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. What's your name? Hendrick. Ha Hendrick, hi. So, so you're, you're from New Jersey or New York? Yeah, North Jersey. Yeah, right across the river. Yeah, right there. What do you think? Has this generation or this group of generations that's currently around, have, have we lost our freedom? What do, you, what do you think? Well, that's a good question. Um, you I mean? mean just, just speaking to people around here, it, it's, it's rather dire, I would say. Just the way people think about it freedoms and the expectations that we would have uh, towards governments. I mean, the mandates, in my opinion, are just, just so far. Uh, and people act like it's totally normal. And I, I find that really concerning. Well, I mean, I'm with you. And, and I would say that, you know, the more that we acquiesce to government and the more that, again, once you give rights back, once you allow yourself to defer, you're not getting, you're not getting that back. The same way that when government rolls a tax over or implements a new tax, they never roll it back. They never say, oh, we have enough money. Oh, we don't have to tax this anymore. <laughs> when do you ever hear that? Is this a bridge too far? I guess is my question. Um, I, I would argue that we have to remain vigilant. I don't want to be like, pessimistic. No, 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 no. Listen, I share Joe's optimism about the fact of, you know, we have to be, we have to be loud about it. We have to be vigilant. Not, no one's saying about destroying property. Okay. The other side likes doing that stuff. It's about coming to the table with ideas and making sure that we stand up for ourselves. We can, dissent is amazing. You have to know how to do it. 
the right way, in the effective way. And I think that our side has been doing that. We're having more and more opinion journalists on a national level. Folks, again, I'm, the numbers don't lie. There's a reason why Ben Shapiro, and again, we might have our favorites in this room, from Ben Shapiro to Steven Crowder to Sean Hannity to Tucker Carlson. Even Alex Jones, even Alex Jones, right? We all have our favorites. But understand something, that the reason that these, and maybe Alex is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an extreme, but the reality is that commonsensical policymaking discussions that come from Tucker Carlson or Ben Shapiro or Candace Owens or Larry Elder, who right now should be the governor of California, but Californians are just as oblivious as I don't know what, but... It's our side of the aisle. It's our, it's our thought processes. They're the ones that are generating views and clicks and more so conversation because we're controlling the dialogue. You look at Spotify, you look at all, whatever you want to cite, YouTube, whatever, whatever, whatever mechanism you want to look at. It's conservatives and right-leaning people that are coming out with thought-provoking content and commonsensical dialogue. Just look it's at the Let's Go Brandon song. Well, I mean, number one on iTunes, number one. Well, I mean, sports. well, I mean, it goes beyond that because I mean that's sort of predicated on a funny notion. But the reality is that when we talk about ideas, it's conservative-minded people that are dominating the, the stratosphere. It's nobody on the left, and I have a lot of friends on the left that do podcasting. Like, I feel like they're dominating, but what's that? I feel like they're dominating, but I'm I mean, we certainly feel that way here in New York City and in New Jersey too. But trust me, when I tell on a national level, it, the epidemic isn't as bad as you think, man. Now, again, it's up to us locally and regionally to get more people to our side, to think critically. I tell my students all the time, I want you to think critically. If nothing else, at the end of the semester, when you're doing your review of my class, whether it's on ratemyprofessors.com or the actual physical, tangible reviews on campus, which, by the way, I hope they're nice. I always tell them, like, you know, I, you know. But I always say, if for nothing else, if I got you to think critically, I did my job. Then when that, when that direct deposit hits, I knew it was for something. But we have to get people to think critically, not emotionally. Because thinking emotionally is no different than, I don't know, just a fight with your girlfriend or your significant other. Okay? It doesn't really lead anywhere sometimes. Okay? You have to be able to think logically and critically. You do that, I promise you, we're going to win. We are winning. Maybe it's not as fast as we would like it, but we'll get there. It's a marathon, folks. It's not a race. It's a marathon. It's going to take time. We have to, as I, as I mentioned, what was your name? Ahelio. Ahelio. As I mentioned, you got to roll up your sleeves. Got to cut your teeth. Got to be willing to take a couple punches. Okay? You have to be willing to do that. If you do that, I promise you, like, you'll be on the right side of stuff. Anybody else? Thank you guys again on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um... You can uh, follow me on Twitter at NoFilterUribe, that's U-R-I-B-E, yeah. and, uh, and on Instagram at Professor Fernando Uribe, and uh, find me on Facebook. It's a, the, ni the nice handsome guy with the suit in the profile picture, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you guys again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again to our two wonderful speakers. I hope you've had a great time. Please, let's give them another round of applause, please. Thank you so much. The night is coming to a close, but please help yourself. There's still some drinks in the back. There's some, uh, some light hors d'oeuvres. And uh, take some pictures. Please be on the lookout for our email blasts that we mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also our social media for the Hispanic Caucus. It's going to be NYYRC Hispanic on the major ones, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We will be going on Getter soon if that's something that everyone else is on. Uh, so again, please see myself, Denise, or Aldo to, we can answer your questions more regarding the caucus and if you'd like to become more involved and we'd be happy to take any suggestions. Thank you again and please enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you.